I'm charged with introducing our next distinguished speaker. My name is Rachel Ada Buff, and I teach here in History and Comparative Ethnic Studies. And um, I appreciate the invitation to introduce Josh Clover from Kennan and the conference by C21. And I want to give a shout out as well to my friend Deborah Wilk, who's here for reading and thinking about poetry with me, which has been a pleasure. The subject of history is collective. The bigness of the no is important. We say it together. Groups of people say it together. But it doesn't always get written that way. So recently in my US is a global power class, which I'm teaching for the very first time, because the people who usually teach it aren't here anymore, which is a whole other story. Um, I taught the story of Patrice Lumumba and the revolution in the Congo through which the Congolese people came to power for a very brief moment of time before being overthrown by collaboration between the CIA and the Belgian army. The ascension of Patrice Lumumba, however briefly, to power was part of the long fetch of a big no to global racial capitalism. And it was pitted in a dialectical way against American exceptionalism and empire. In a certain way, this no Lumumba, if you don't know the story, is very quickly after giving an Independence Day speech, which you could say was a historic big no, um, was taken off and assassinated by an interesting collaboration of the CIA internal enemies and the Belgian army. And I got really interested in this story, so I talked to my colleague, um, Marcus Filippello, who was here yesterday. I'm not sure he's here today, I don't see him. And I said, wow, I'd really like to read more about this movement that brought Lumumba to power, what happened afterwards. Um, you know, a lot of things happened in Congo, civil war and oppression. And he said, well, there really hasn't been much history of that because once Mobutu Sese Seko comes to power, no, it's, it becomes an act of bravery to write the history, to record it, and we don't know what archives are left, really. Um, so the collective no, the big no of the Congolese revolution is hidden in plain sight, remembered around the country, but not recorded. We don't have access to it. We don't have that story. It happened. We know that. Lumumba is the signifier of that story. But we don't have the fuller story. I, was, I wanted to know sort of the collective story. Josh Clover's work moves towards a radical reframing of subjectivity as collective. His three books of critical theory, his three books of poems, his ambidextrous enterprises, and this is important, I think, in and of itself in saying no to a certain disciplinarity. His highly acclaimed work, he's received awards such as the Pushcart Prize for Poetry, the Robert P. Richardson Award for Nonfiction Writing, the Walt Whitman Award for the first book of, for first books of poetry, all comprise important interventions that reframe the Western humanities canon that has traditionally reduced interiority to an individual experience, so that it is hard to know how to act or how to be collectively. It is revolutionary, for example, to think, what if the subject of the lyric was collective? And since Josh is not reading his poetry, I'll just read you a little. The best poetry will have contempt for its era, but so will the worst. This is from Red Epic. It must be made from everything, including text. This is the minimal formula for realism. But it does not align itself with text. It must align itself with work, meaning hatred of work. It must desire change so much it is accused of being in love with annihilation. It must, in fact, love annihilation. The rest is sophism. This transformation in our understanding of revolutionary subjects, and that's a quote from Clover's abstract for the talk today, envisions an alternate collective future. It's coming out night after night more of us than there are of them. It's saying no to every deal. Remember, nothing belongs to you because nothing belongs to anyone. The revolution in the humanities is a collective no. I give you Josh Clover. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. That was extremely generous and thoughtful. Um, I'm grateful for that. Can people hear okay? My voice is not great, but the sound system here is amazing, um, thanks to the, the people who've been working on it. So is Audible okay in the, in the back? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, before I start, I should 
thank a few people. Kenan and Cal, obviously, I've been thinking about them a lot. I'm, I'm having to host a sort of largest conference for the first time myself in June, and um, I'm already despairing that it couldn't possibly work as well as this one has and is as well uh, formed. So I'm being taught a lesson, at least, and I'm grateful for that uh, and for all the help, also to the staff and, and organizing team that helped put this together. I want to especially thank, among them, Christina Lee, uh, who was for, before being here was a grad, uh, student at, at uh, UC Davis where I teach, uh, which gives us a nice sense of, she, she seen me like show a PowerPoint and gesticulate for 45 minutes several times in the past, and so uh, it feels like home a bit in that way, and I'm grateful for uh, her help and her presence. I also want to thank three things punk rock, hip hop, and feminism, particularly, <laughs> particularly my mom's feminism for um, instructing me in the power of no early on uh, with lessons that I've tried to keep with me uh, and I think carry through uh, things I continue to think about to this day. Revolution is history's big no. The question of revolutionary subjects is the question of who within history's logic might emerge to contradict that history's affirmative character. As I, like Ovid, am interested in nothing but transformation, I am particularly compelled by how the emergences and affordances of revolutionary actors might change over time rather than having any ontological consistency. Antagonisms, no matter how essential, can only be understood, can only find their significance and become self-coherent. Insofar as we can discern the history-making movement which gives them form and substance. I want to trace out this history-making movement as it arrives in our here and now. Inevitably, we'll have to start somewhere else. In fact, we'll have to start with France, which is to say, against France. Thus, it should really be le big non. <laughs> we begin not with one non, but with two, both from the movies, both from the 60s, both involving wars against France. One from the metropole, one from the colony. The first is from a documentary made in the working class outskirts of Paris with a, a, a remarkable title, Return to Work at the Wonder Factory. It reaches back to the French origins of cinema, 1895's workers leaving the Lumiere factory. It is fair to say that the thematic of workers and factories, the problem of the proletariat, is one of cinema's, funda cinema's fundamental thematics. This version, which like the original focuses on female labor, is made by students from the striking cinema school. It is spring of 1968, everybody's on strike. Having agreed that documenting the events is not strike-breaking, this will be the student's third and final film in the shadow of the still unsigned Grinnell Accords. Per the opening narration, on the morning of June 10th, 1968, after three weeks of strike and occupation of the factory, the workers of Wonder and saint Juan, called together by their boss, agreed to return to work by a vote of 564, 260 against. Then it introduces the action, that same day at 1.30. The main action is this, a woman does not wish to return to work. She does not want to accede to the vote. The union functionaries from the CNT explain, placate, try to guide her back, all with paternalistic sang -foi. Occasionally, a Maoist etabli looks on. Let's watch just about 45 seconds of this. It's a 10 minute long uh, movie. Donc, ça, je te dis, là, il n'y a pas de rien à voir. C'est pas vrai, pas, c'est pas trop, avec... 
Il a 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 The woman keeps saying no, shouting no. She does not wish to exchange absolute negation for a few more vacation days. Any fate but that of being absorbed back into the factory. No, she says, I'm not going to get fucked again. I'm not going to work in there. I'm not walking back in that place. I'm not putting a foot back in that cell. But she will. We know she will. Decades later, for a meta-documentary called La Reprise, a team will track down the filmmakers and all the people who appear in the film, except for our hero who cannot be found. She remains known only as the woman who says no. We don't know much about her. She does her hair in the style of Anna Karina, as people did. Karina, as she had appeared most recently in Lo Straniero, this is Visconti's version of L'Etranger, finally put to film in 1967, a different return, in this case, of the Algerian decolonial war. This is surely the other fundamental thematic of cinema in this moment and beyond, the colonial problem. Chris Marker's Le Joli Mai, arguably the most influential French documentary of the decade, is not about 1968, but rather offers a survey of life in the metropole after the Evian Accords and Algerian independence. The two Mays, then. The Battle of Algiers, the most significant Western representation of anti-colonial warfare in the 60s, preceded Los Straniero by one year and returned to work by two. It was banned in France until 1970. And perhaps that could be the other null. But no, the other null is within the film and within decolonial struggle. An unnamed character, having been already tortured, forced humiliatingly into a French uniform, struggles miserably not to give over information about the resistance fighters. But he will. We know he will. The opening credits have not yet rolled. Here's an, again about 45 seconds. It is him against, hopelessly against, the officers and the police. Nonetheless, <coughs> he is able to offer a single excruciating no to stand for desperate and incomplete negation and it is this that properly causes the film to begin, the title to appear, just as it will end with a reverse shot of this, with the lumpen streaming down the stairs, the beginning of the ultimate uprising of the decolonial struggle, the rising of the subjugated and the colonized, the social no that will end in Algerian liberation. So these are the two no's with which I begin, two nameless characters, two hands on the shoulder, the two iterations of allons-y, let's go. The two parallel yet utterly distinct modes of domination. I want to note, as part of my habit of lining up extended series of imperfect pairings, and as a matter of being attentive to where we are, that we might see in these two frameworks a relation to the particularities of Milwaukee. <coughs> its history and its present organization. Milwaukee is the first city in the United States to have a socialist mayor to send a socialist representative to Congress. It is also the most segregated city in the nation currently, with the highest black youth unemployment, a basis for the riots here last year. These two features offer a local reflection on the two problems raised above. The problem of the proletariat and the colonial problem. But I take that phrase from elsewhere. The fact is that the so-called European civilization, Western civilization, as it has been shaped by two centuries of bourgeois rule, this is Césaire, 
is incapable of solving the two major problems to which its existence has given rise, the problem of the proletariat and the colonial problem. What I want to suggest is that these two problems, while remaining distinct, disclose a conceptual unity in the fact and figure of surplus population, surplus to capital and its needs, and thus understandable only incompletely within that logic. Recent discussions of surplus population generally understand its historical increase, detailed by Mike Davis, Jan Bremen, Jacques Charm, and others, as a consequence of capitalist development. Stagnant surplus populations are the specter waiting at the conclusion of Marx's extended logical argument in Volume 1 of Capital, Chapter 25, before the book leaps backward into history. The crisis character of capital, driven by compulsory increases in productivity, <coughs> manifests itself in what I call the production of non-production. Excess capacity and excess labor stand cheek by jowl, with no rationale by which they might be brought together, at least not within capital's logic. While accepting this account, I want nonetheless to approach the problem, Césaire's so two problems, somewhat differently by presupposing that the threat of surplus population as something that is imminent to the bourgeois era. In turn, I suggest that strategies for managing this threat help constitute different regimes of politics and distinct views about revolutionary actors. I do not mean, however, simply to taxonomize, but to attend to a striking fact of our era, which is the convergence of these two regimes. <coughs> now, my title, Really, my subtitle, which names the two regimes of managing surplus, risks misreading. This talk, at least initially, may seem to set those regimes against each other, one under the name of Marx and one under the name of Fennel. Consequently, it may appear, particularly in our moment, that this is an intervention into debates about the primacy of capitalism or colonialism as master terms for understanding the historical dynamic which has most ambitiously and fatally organized the globe. Even worse, it may seem to offer a reductive opposition of race and class of the sort that has burst forth anew in the wake of the recent presidential election and the asymmetrical rise of xenophobic nationalism and social democratic <coughs> populism. As I hope will become clear, this is not the case, though I will take Césaire at his word that there is such a thing as two centuries of bourgeois rule, within which his two problems increasingly take their significance. One might also suspect that I'm adopting the term coloniality from Anibal Chiano in his well-known essays on coloniality and power, wherein it designates an ensemble of characteristics weighted toward the epistemological that define in the first instance the relation of Europe and Latin America developed well in advance of Césaire's two centuries. Hopefully this confusion can be avoided. I'm using it instead to refer to the mode of social organization and management explored by Fanon, particularly in Wretched of the Earth. As will, I hope, become clear, I use coloniality rather than colonialism, simply to distinguish it as an approach to domination rather than as a national order, global political project and ideology such that we can think of instances of coloniality at various scales, including the domestic and local, though no doubt the nation state has been the form through which coloniality has been most dramatically imposed as colonialism, and whose existence has most depended on the violence of coloniality. <coughs> but among the differences between Marx and Fanon, and there are several, their vision of revolutionary subjects stands in dramatic opposition, opposed neatly by their assessments of the status of the London proletariat, those outside the formal wage. Surely all remember the macaronic litany in the 18th Brumaire, which I very much enjoy reading. Vagabonds, discharged soldiers, discharged jailbirds, escaped galley slaves, swindlers, mountebanks, lazaroni, Pickpockets, tricksters, gamblers, macaro, this is the, uh, the French term for pimp, which is from whence we now have the term mac. Brothel keepers, porters, literati, organ grinders, rag pickers, knife grinders, tinkers, beggars, in short, the whole indefinite disintegrated mass, as Marx says. 
decisively counter-revolutionary, subject to the sway of whoever holds the day, notably Bonaparte, quote, chief of the Paris Lumpen proletariat. For Fanon, the matter appears contrarily. These men, he writes, forced off the family land by the growing population in the countryside and by colonial expropriation, circle the towns tirelessly, hoping that one day or another they will be let in. It is among these masses in the people of the shanty towns and the lumpen proletariat that the insurrection will find its urban spearhead. The lumpen proletariat, this cohort of starving men divorced from tribe and clan, constitutes one of the most spontaneously and radically revolutionary forces of a colonized people. Thus we think he is talking about some other social fraction. He conjures Marx's litany immediately thereafter. So the pimps, hooligans, the unemployed, petty criminals, when approached, give the liberation struggle all they've got, devoting themselves to the cause like valiant workers. It is hard not to understand that concluding simile as a specific demand on Marx or on orthodox Marxism to understand the surplus population as part of an expanded proletariat, as class revolutionaries. In reading Fanon in the 21st century, Emmanuel Wallerstein points us to the salience of this debate, noting that Césaire's discourse on colonialism remains the classic expression of why intellectuals of the colonial world withdrew their commitment to communist parties, and so on. The key issue he notes in these debates was the question of which classes are those that are struggling. And having set forth this debate, he warns us not to make too much of Fanon's contribution. There were many proposals for new candidates for the historical subject who would be the spearhead of revolutionary activity, he notes. Fanon thought he had located them in the detribalized, urbanized London proletariat, but he admitted his doubts when he depicted the pitfalls of spontaneity. This much is true. Fanon understands the lumpen insurrection as a moment that must transform toward broader struggle, not as the revolution entire. <laughs> Yet in his curiously bifurcated rebuttal, Wallerstein restates Fanon in somewhat moralizing terms. Violence, he notes, however therapeutic and however effective, solves nothing. Thanks, Dad. Well, reorienting Fanon's argument back toward an orthodoxy it would not recognize. Lumpen classes on their own without organizational structure burn out. We might on another occasion wonder if there is a subterranean current joining orthodoxy and moralism. For the moment, rather than choosing sides, I want only to pursue the basis of the seeming disagreement here between Marx and Fanon. To state matters as clearly as possible. For all Marx's contempt and Fanon's optimism, their divergence does not rest on some variation of opinion about the character of the lumpen. Nor need it be the case that one must be correct, the other mistaken. Choosing a side in this debate is to miss its historically concrete character. Rather, we might say that the lumpen proletariat has a different position in the metropole in 1850 than in the colony a century later. The former is characterized by the dynamism, by, by the rude expansion of adolescent capital on the march, and in turn by impersonal domination of the wage whose grace would fall on more people each year, calling out even to the society of December 10th, who could imagine plucking the fruits of capital's largesse, who felt, in Marx's words, the need of benefiting themselves at the expense of the laboring nation. The latter is characterized by a peculiar motion, one whose truth is the real stasis of a world compartmentalized, Manichaean, and petrified. A world of statues, the statues of the general, the statue of the engineer who built the bridge. For Fanon, the colonial subject is a man penned in. Apartheid is but one method compartmentalizing the colonial world. In this situation, the lumpen proletariat constitutes a serious threat to the security of the town and signifies the irreversible rot and the gangrene eating into the heart of colonial domination. Colonial rule thus is securitization. This security threat, the absolute proscription on any kind of integration, the racialized proscription which constitutes the colonized, will not be, cannot be, managed in Maine by wage discipline which is the social form of integration, will be managed rather by direct domination. The 
colonized world is a world divided in two. The dividing line, the border, is represented by the barracks and the police station. In the colonies, the official legitimate agent, the spokesperson for the colonizer and the regime of oppression, is police officer or the soldier. Which is a way of understanding, among other things, that the colonial relation, even from a Marxist standpoint, must be understood as featuring not just subjugated, unfree labor, compelled by the lash, but subjugated, unfree non-labor. We see then the distinct solutions to Césaire's two problems of the proletariat in the metropole and the excluded in the colony. Two forms of threatening surplus. One solution is economic expansion. The capacity to take that surplus population into the circuits of value production and accumulation. The thematic that Lukács, in discussing the 18th and 19th century novel, names as reconciliation. This is the regime I'm calling absorption. The other is open and imminent violence directed against those for whom every doorway is labeled no entry, but for the colonial world itself forever labeled no exit. That is the regime I am calling coloniality. The opposition should not be exaggerated. It is in truth not an opposition at all. Both absorption and coloniality feature both racialized domination and the regulatory compulsion of value production. Perhaps we are speaking of a relatively unitary colonial capitalism, there being no other kind, or capitalist colonization. There may nonetheless be a certain yield to drawing the distinction to noting the differing orientations between the two regimes. While the former features and arguably depends on racialized exclusion, on moments of internal colonization, this is subordinated to capital self-expansion and intensification at the scale of national economy. While the latter is subject to the constraints of global capitalist relations, it is not an absorptive capitalism, at least not absorptive enough to challenge what Fanon insists is the historical speciation which divides colonizer and colonized. And it is from within these two regimes, absorption and coloniality, that the lumpen appear differently, here as counter-revolutionary dregs, here as revolutionary edge. If one accepts implicitly or openly the premise of ongoing accumulation at a global scale, as I think more of us do than we might at first imagine, the assumption is that unevenness between these two regimes will smooth over time. This is in fact proved to be the case. However, it has not happened in the way that Mark, that foreseen either by Orthodox Marxism or by the apostles of capital. Rather than the so-called underdeveloped nations creeping or lurching forward, the developed nations have become overdeveloped in ways that have effectively moved them back toward a political economy which, if not technically colonial, whatever that might mean, is non-absorptive in a way that functionally replicates coloniality. Cannon spoke yesterday of anti-reconciliation as a species of no, as a stance or demand. We must also understand it as a real and systematic situation that exists autonomous of any individual disposition, a regime wherein any desire for reconciliation with the circuits of value production cannot be met where more and more people globally find themselves circling towns never to be granted admission. This is our present. Increasing productivity has led these nations through peak labor force participation as sectors expand behind high profit rates and then toward a deindustrialization where an ever higher productivity no longer yields an extension of the wage, leaving both absolute and relative increase of population consigned to the informal economy. It is the technical category of informalization that Marx is setting forth in his great litany. Those for whom secondary access to the wage, petty production, gray market recirculation, and so on, provide the only hope of survival. What he did not envision was its growth until it provided no longer the lower margin of a class, a provisional conjury is drifting in and out of the labor pool, but a class fragment itself, truly stagnant, and simply excluded historically along logics of race and ethnicity that both recapitulate and reproduce racial ascription. It is precisely this drama that anim animates efforts to understand the relation of US ghettos to colonies abroad, an effort that depends only partially on analogy in the formulations of, for example, Huey P. Newton. 
He feels compelled to discover the political economy of social death. The situation is ambiguous, heterogeneous, as is racial capitalism in its truest form. Trying to grasp the situation, Newton contradicts himself. On one side, black populations are ruthlessly exploited to deliver super profits necessary for imperial adventure. The slavery of blacks in this country provides the oil for the machinery of war that America uses to enslave the world, he writes. On the other, black populations are excluded from about 1960 onward a racialized deindustrialization starts to take hold in the cities of the Second Great Migration. Consequently, penned up in the ghettos of America, surrounded by all his factories and all the physical components of his economic system, we have been made into the wretched of the earth, relegated to the position of spectators. Black lumpen, catastrophically free of wage discipline, must in turn be managed by the occupying army, embodied by the police department. The echoes of Fanon's colonial world are unmistakable. This exclusion is registered even earlier by the prescient James Boggs, circa 1963, the year of Wretched's translation into English. Today in the United States, there is no doubt that those at the bottom are growing in numbers much faster than the system will ever be able to absorb, he suggests, concluding that America is headed toward full unemployment, not full unemployment. Sorry, not full employment. Those who do find work are trapped in a job market so intensely polarized there can be no escape imagined from poverty. Meanwhile, those surplus to the needs of capital and empire grow and grow restless. Boggs' Detroit in the following years would be defined by the intersection of absorption struggles and risings against coloniality, by the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the Great Rebellion whose 50th anniversary we will mark this summer. It is 1967, the same year as Newton's double exposure of the ghetto, the same moment as our initial to null. My argument, if it has not yet become clear, is that Newton's contradiction, or Detroit's, is not a paradox, not a sign of inadequate analysis, but the precise registration of a transformation in flight. These instances figure coloniality within absorption, and particularly coloniality's emergence as the capacity for absorption wanes in the face of irresolvable crisis. One signal account of this transition is surely that of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who identifies hyper-incarceration of blacks in the US incisively within a context of crisis and surplus. The state management of surplus articulated within a logic of domestic securitization against urban threat, whose official a legitimate agent, to repeat Fanon, the spokesperson for the colonizer and the regime of oppression is police officer or soldier, is precisely how I have defined coloniality. Another account is policing the crisis by Stuart Hall and his comrades, the text in which Hall first tests out his repeated formula, raises the modality through which class is lived. In both cases, we can follow fairly close and empirical studies of the ways that surplus population, both raced non-white and classed as lumpen, in train of broad economic collapse beginning in the 60s from which there has been no substantive recovery, how these people are disciplined increasingly by a direct domination. This is the most distressing evocation of the oceanic change in question. And it is the change I want to stress, the historical change for which we must account, which figures as a global recomposition of social relations. The LNZ of the colonel replaces that of the union rep. Indeed, and this aspect of the argument will have to be developed elsewhere, we might see the no of our nameless woman as the collapse of the workers' movement in the West, as unions devolve into purely defensive struggles and the declining absorption of the labor market leaves a slack that destroys workers' bargaining power even as it undermines profitability of firms. From this point on, the class mass party sequence leading to seizure of state power and a transitional program for socialist ownership recedes from the revolutionary horizon. The program era is over. But something else is beginning or returning, <coughs> utterly changed in this transformed circumstance. The big no is no longer an impossible demand, 
a subjective cry after absorption's end. It is a recognition of the objective circumstance as it must be lived. Which is to say that we find ourselves here, now, in a world closer to that of Fanon than Marx. The United States is the greatest absorptive regime the world has ever known, and the most self-regarding. You can tell because this is the nation's motto. It is written in huge letters on the Statue of Liberty. Welcome to the world capital of absorption. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> but not by much. <laughs> this is what has come to an end. New York, in fact, offers a convenient periodization for the United States. During the 1977 blackout, when the entire power grid failed for 25 hours, only the torch on the Statue of Liberty stayed lit, having a separate power source. By the time of Superstorm Standy, famously, the only lights in downtown Manhattan belonged to a single corporate headquarters with their autonomous generator, Goldman Sachs. The earthly representative of profit without accumulation, wealth without absorption. The lights are beaming wonders, but history is the blackout. This turn toward greater rather than lesser coloniality, ever more oriented not by left-right debates within a liberal democratic framework, but by the axis of inclusion and exclusion, is the basis, among other things, for Black Lives Matter, for the resurgence of what I have elsewhere called surplus rebellions or urban rioting, and for a renewed nativist code of hyper-racism and protectionism. When we think of Trump's accession, we might understand it as an experiment in management style for the end of absorption. This broader phenomenon, the end of absorption and the arrival of the colony to the metropole, is no less marked in Europe. Indeed, it is the continental story from Brexit to the re refugee crisis to the incipient dissolution of the EU. The debate over borders and their ongoing closure may appear as xenophobia, and no doubt it is. Its power and its salience is driven no less by the European economic community's ongoing stagnation, a continental zero-sum economic game, which has enriched Germany and to some extent the Netherlands at the expense of the Euro periphery, with France holding even. Zero-sum, end of absorption, same difference. And so Fortress Europe is now the town Fennel mentions around which the global lumpen circle, hoping that one day or another they will be allowed inside. <coughs> Even this dire achievement is not on offer. So then, some summary remarks as I conclude. One, disclosed along the way. Liberal democracy, the kind with the left and a right, not long ago thought to have generalized itself so thoroughly that history had ended, is waning. It is not waning because it is being overdone by the rapacity of capitalism, as Wendy Brown or Achille Mbembe or even perhaps Wolfgang Streck would have me believe, but because it is absorptive capitalism's management style and must decline with it. Alexis de Tocqueville saw this uh, entanglement of liberal rights and dynamic labor markets early on, noting the relationship you can see there between uh, logics of equality and rights and a growth of a, a, an endless labor market. Two, thereby the US and Europe, the so-called developed nations, capitals, home counties, are overdeveloping toward a weaponized mode of inclusion-exclusion against and by which the planetary classes dangereuses are increasingly united not by their role as producers, but by their relation to state violence. Consequently, the informalized, the surplus populations take on Fanon's revolutionary aspect more broadly. The no of Paris is not simply the dialectical other of the no of Algiers, but increasingly must become it. Three, this risks setting the excluded against the working class that still exists as a sociological fact, central to the imaginary of various contemporary social democratic visions, occasionally under the heading of the white working class. This imaginary, despite occasional and sometimes indifferent lip service to racialized exclusion, retains a world picture of social reorganization 
derived entirely from the expansivity of absorptive capital and the organizational protocols that accompany that capacity. Or four, we will develop an expanded sense of a global proletariat as a historical phenomenon premised in a shifting set of relations, open to and indeed unable to escape transformation, which in the present discovers this potential for a new unity of lumpen and labor, allowed precisely by the weakening of intra-class competition, which follows dripping immiseration from the end of absorption. If there is to be a revolutionary project, it will resemble decolonization, not in the sense of nationalist armed struggle against a colonial state, but as a struggle against a capitalism compelled to act as colonial. These are the coordinates toward which a potential recomposition of class power might orient itself and find its own historical significance. It will not be orderly in the ways imagined by the prophets of revolutionary projects preserved from the previous century. Like Fennell's decolonization, this revolution which sets out to change the order of the world is obviously a program of complete disorder. As a final gesture, we might consider one of the early efforts of conceptualizing the leap of this manner of antagonism to the metropole in Sam Greenlee's epical novel, The Spook Who Sat by the Door. The book takes as its fundamental problematic the question of how riot can become revolution. For Greenlee, writing in the late 60s, the book is published in 1969. It is precisely the presence of black surplus population gathered in U.S. ghettos that provides the conditions of possibility for such a leap. Oakland blew first. Then Los Angeles, then leapfrogging the continent, Harlem and South Philadelphia, every city with a ghetto, wondered if that might be next. The most powerful nation in history stood on the brink of panic and chaos. One, two, many Algiers. In an eloquent dialectical turn, it is precisely the techne of global repression, the state's investment in preserving the imperial aspirations that provides for the success of this war against the state, owing to our titular hero skills acquired as the token black officer with the CIA, distributed to a network of the informalized, the wageless, gamblers, macaho, brothel keepers, porters, possibly even literati. <coughs> Counterinsurgency and securitization at a global level return as insurgency and threat in the urban cores, hollowed by, developmental, by development itself. It is hard to say that history's no will unfold in precisely this manner. It is certain that there will be no return to work at the Wonder Factory. Thank you very much. here to not answer your questions. <laughs> yes? Uh, thanks for a, a really brilliant and uh, inspiring analytic. Um, for the last 10, maybe 20 years, we heard a great deal of commentary from David Harvey on down using the terminology of neoliberalism to understand any of these same phenomena. This is not a term that you would use, or did you? And I was wondering if you could put the discourse on neoliberalism into any kind of dialogue with the analytics that you're providing and what the advantages are of the, the way in which you're proceeding. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to answer that question next. No, I'm... <laughs> uh, no, I mean, because it's such a good question, I feel like I know we often have this problem, right? But the, it's such a good question. Uh, an adequate answer would take longer than we, we really have. But here's, so here's a very short answer. I tend not to use the word neoliberalism, as, as, as you noticed, and tend to somewhat object to it existing. Pache, Philip Morawski, who's probably the best history of the, of the historian of the term, I simply don't think it exists meaningfully as a coherent ideology. I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and says, I'm a neoliberal, I have policies, I'm going to impose them now. It's in fact incredibly contradictory. It refers to um, phenomena that are, that are directly in contrast with each other. Uh, it, it's not very explanatory of what happens. 
It's sort of a blanket term for, as best I can tell, the fact that starting in the mid-60s, uh, capitalist profitability in lots of different ways and lots of different measures started to decline drastically. Different locations tried different strategies to re restore profitability. And those strategies to restore profitability in an aggregate, sometimes contradictory, like what they tried in Argentina, what they tried in the US, and what they tried in Central Europe, totally different. But we call it all neoliberalism because neoliberalism is a name for the set of strategies to restore profitability. Uh, and I find it much more useful to think about it in those political economic terms rather than as ideological phenomenon and a set of beliefs people have, which for me is always going to trail reality rather than, rather than lead it. So yeah, I don't get a lot of bang out of saying neoliberalism, and I tend to want to look at the political economic particulars uh, in a given situation. I do recognize that people need a rhetorical enemy uh, and, a, and a term, and I think it functions that way, but I don't think it functions much better than the 1% function during Occupy. It's, a, it's actually a fairly weak shorthand more and more, it's a, it's a way to avoid thinking about a problem and just sort of say, like, neo, it's neoliberalism's fault. And of course, the great downside of it is, I think, evident in Wendy Brown's recent work, um, which is, as is inevitably the case with Wendy, insightful, but for me quite limited, in that it allows a vision of return to a liberalism, mm -hmm. which is somehow desirable. Mm -hmm. I have two pieces of bad news. One, liberal, liberalism fucking sucked for most of the planet. Two, even if we wanted to get back to it, it's not possible. That thing I'm calling absorptive capital, liberalism rested on that. On an expanding capital that grew at least 3, 3.5% per year GDP anywhere, that's liberalism's foundation. We are never going back to that. It's just not possible. So it's neither desirable nor possible to go back to that liberalism, and I worry that the term neoliberalism <coughs> presents that as both desirable and possible, which is... Uh, heuristically dangerous. Yeah? At the risk of sounding like a fool, could you... I already did that. Could you go on in layman's terms, uh, re-explain what you mean by colonialism, like the definition? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. At the risk of sounding a fool. Um... I'm not sure how, I mean, I, I sort of endeavored not to use the word colonialism, right, which has lots of definitions, they're, they're greatly contested, I actually don't want to enter into that debate, and tried to talk about this phenomenon calling coloniality. Um, that is also somewhat contested. As I tried to know, the most famous usage, uh, or the, 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 the most regulatory usage of it, which, is, which is, comes out of these essays by a uh, South American uh, thinker named Annabelle Keanu is, is not the way I'm using it. I'm using it to refer to um, the mode of population management, although that makes me sound like a Foucauldian, which all my friends would think is weird. Uh, the, the mode of population management that Fanon describes in Wretched of the Earth, uh, among, among other places, in which population is managed not by wage discipline. Sorry, what's happening? Putting the lights on. End of super sexy time. <laughs> uh, um, in which population unable to be managed or, or not desired to be managed by wage discipline is managed by the barracks and the courts, by direct domination, uh, by force. And this is a situation, you know, Fanon talks about speciation, in which he, so he talks about colonized or uncolonized, but the colonized don't exist as colonized before colonization. They're rendered as the colonized. As, this, as what Fanon described as a new species by the violence of colonization. And the, um, that static relation, which doesn't involve the sort of expansive characteristic of what I'm calling absorptive capitalism, has to be managed by force. That's the nature of static situations. They have to be held in place by, by force. There's no dynamic like gyroscope spin, so they're stable. If there's no spin, something else has to hold it in place. Uh, and that, that management by force and direct domination rather than the impersonal domination of, of capitalism is uh, applied whether at a local level or at a national level is how I'm thinking about the term coloniality. Does that make any, is that useful? What you're saying is that the police force is what's holding the, I guess, proletariat in place right at this moment. The police force are a representative of a, of a social organization. Right? It's not just the police force. 
I don't want to identify it, is that when we think about structural, I mean, you know, Frank started to talk about the difference in kinds of violence yesterday. And when the violence of the colonial relation, the police force are a representative of it, just as any given police officer is a representative of it, but I don't think it can be simply located in the, in the police force, right? They're, they're a particular dramatic visible expression of a sy- systematic violence that holds the relation in place that's utterly imminent and always present and appears at every level of, and stratum of life. Thank you. Uh, one, two. Um, thank you for the talk. That was really inspiring. Um, so hovering sometimes literally outside of what you were talking about, um, circling the towns in your really lovely formation, are refugees and migrants. And so um, they're there. They're like a, they're, they're invoked by the term vagabond in my Marx in the 18th Premier. So I want to hear you. That's so imminent in our in this moment, right? So I hear you think more about refugees and migrancy in general as applied to the general picture you just sketched out. If you want. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, I should. <laughs> um, again, I don't want to offer a, a, a sort of a, a overly unified global picture. I, I, mean, I, I think the most sort of dramatic figure of it is, is what's happening in, in Europe, particularly, particularly Western Europe in the, over the last couple of years in which you know, people overstate things. It's not like borders were magically open before um, and are magically closed now. People sort of exaggerate the drama, like they're closing the border. Uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's a motion that's happening. Uh, and it, it's, for me, a motion that's inseparable from Europe's capacity to absorb labor inputs. That's a sort of a coldly technical way to put the... Um, astonishing, horrifying drama of human misery and human uh, brutality directed against refugees and immigrants that, that's happening. And I don't mean to, to reduce it to that, but I also don't mean to disentangle it from that, since I think that would be a sort of analytic uh, fa- failure for, for us. So, for example, like the, the you know, the, the formation of the, of the European Union and the European Economic Zone was a quite specific, specific uh, historical political economic project. It was understood that the U.S. regime of capital accumulation sort of organized the globe, was, was bound to wane. Questions were raised about, about how the globe would next be organized. Um, certainly, like, you know, no one thought the U.K. would rise again. Like, that's not happening. So, but there was this idea that if Europe could unify as an economic unit, it could center the, globe, the global economy and sort of take the baton pass, as it were, from the U.S. in this history of, of cycles of accumulation best laid out by Fernand Braudel and Giovanni Arrighi and, and, and so on. Uh, and so that was an explicit project of, of Maastricht and, and all of this. Uh, and so the goal was to have a new sort of center of absorption as it were, and that structured their policies around immigrants and, and migration in the EU for a long time. The thing is, it didn't work. Right? It ran into its limits fairly early on, actually. Uh, uh, the, the failure of the euro to really take off as a, as a currency, and then the zero growth of the eurozone in general. It became clear it wasn't going to be a new absorptive center, and as this became clear, more and more, there was a realization that people would have to regulate uh, their labor markets rather than count on this endless expansion. And we start to see a series of regulations uh, come, come into place. And some are explicitly political, done by governments, and some are done by Brexit vote and mobilized xenophobia and all kinds of racism to, to get the job done. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly dramatic relationship. And, you know, this is my big pessimism, uh, which is to say that the demand that, you, that Europe take human rights seriously in this regard and the demand for open borders, I think are the right demands, but I think people should understand what they're demanding. They're dem- demanding a, a restart of expansive capitalism in those places, because other, otherwise it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, it doesn't happen unless capitalism falls, and you, and you can put in a whole new set of policies. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's the significant framework to talk about it. You know, right now we're in a funny situation where Germany is the most liberal state in Europe, taking in, like, and seems like, oh, suddenly Angela Merkel is the, is the, is the good cop, um, taking in a lot of refugees. 
unsurprisingly, Germany has by far the highest rates of profitability in the EU. Like there's, it's, the indexicality of these things is awesome. Uh, and I get puzzled when people overlook it. There's a question over there, and then, and then in the very back. Um, yeah, Andrew. I actually just want to follow, follow up on something you said about um, you know uh, relaxing migrant policy, you know relaxing immigration policy would be equivalent to the demand of a resumption of expensive capitalism, unless you know, we also completely overturn capitalization. Were you not just arguing that a return to expansive capitalism is impossible, or did I misunderstand? No, no, you understood me perfectly. Okay. okay. So basically, that's impossible. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't do it, but, I, but even so, what I, what I mean, guess one of the things I'm interested in is, so on the one hand, there's what I take to be an empirical situation, which is that um, incredibly high rates of productivity have meant that we can, that, like, there's, there can be a, a, the, the high production of consumer goods without high employment. Um, and as a result, there's not going to be an expansion of the labor market forthcoming. And I don't, I don't see any fundamental change in that in the developed, overdeveloped nations. That's an empirical fact. But I'm also interested in the ways that certain kinds of political visions are premised on the assumption, because it's held true in the West for a couple hundred years, that that expansion has been continuing and will continue. Like I deeply think that sort of ortho-social democratic policies, Bernie policies, or whatever, um, the politics of Jacobin, let's say, are oriented by an assumption that that expansion exists and will continue and is, is possible. Um, that the wage franchise can be extended to more people, that there can be labor organization based around that possible inclusion in the wage, that there can be demand for full employment, and so on. All of these demands are not possible, but I'm interested in the fact that the belief in their possibility provides a context for a certain <coughs> idea of politics. That uh, you know, that I reject, not because I think, oh, those are, those, those are terrible things to offer. Bernie should promise everything, right? which is, which is a, a, a certain kind of uh, resistance to that. But just that the, the, the politics on offer assumes a social, political, economic scenario that's not within reach. And I'm more interested in a realist politics, which is to say one must demand the impossible. Back. Here. Thanks for the, the talk, People who ask questions and start marching toward you swiftly are <laughs> anxious making. <laughs> yeah. Stay right where I am. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I, I, was, I had a question. Um, I guess uh, much of what you said seemed very familiar to me. Um, and maybe the only thing that jolted me a bit was, that was uh, despite this very, which I found very helpful, um, uh, Thinking of like the intersection of uh, capital becoming a colonial force at the moment, where it results now to direct domination, uh, to manage a population that you know, the property is poor and so on, right? There's a sort of uh, another sort of historical boomerang of the, the colonial the coloniality. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, as I uh, think you highlighted, right, like, that's not going to look like the same sort of uh, local proletariat or, or decolonial warfare that once did, even in the 60s, right? Um, and so I'm wondering about the sort of like, uh, visions of emancipation uh, that might um, perhaps be more suitable to our current uh, conjuncture. Um, and I noticed uh, you, you wanted to still talk about it as sort of this new class, or this new, uh, still as a class warfare, right? At the same time as you're very obviously acknowledging that right, the only thing that binds people who are left outside of this uh, absorptive process is precisely this absence of anything like a dynamic uh, relationship to the economy, right? Which is shut out of the economy, per se. So I guess it's a twofold question. One is like, you know, there's been an effort to talk about the effort you know, to take that sort of selection that, well, of which those people will be left out of and turn it into a secession and to frame that as the abolition of the economy, per se, economic abolitionism. Uh, in other words, the attempt to destitute uh, the economy and to do something else, right? 
Um, and I wondered what, uh, what you thought about the proposal uh, that we start talking about abolishing the economy as maybe whether that's appropriate to that thought if, uh, of a situation in which the economy only presents itself through direct force of right? Because certainly the dynamic's not going to be kick out the settler in the name of the native, right? And to some extent, it was in the direction, right? Um, but if that were to be abolish the economy that only presents itself in terms of the violence of the war, is that a, is that way we think about it? And I guess the other sort of side of that is to wonder about like maybe the, the ban on graven images in your uh, presentation of this, the sort of uh, reticence to talk about uh, visions of emancipation. Um, and you can't do everything in one talk, but I wondered if you were, if you, when you look at the world, do you see moments where uh, something like uh, contemporary visions of emancipation are able to think of something other than, other than a no? That's a lot. Thanks. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure I can offer an answer adequate to the, to the thinking there. In, in a way, I, I sort of suspect you might have more interesting things to say about this, this question than I do, in part because I, I really do believe in the big no, which is to say, you, you refer to it as a ban on graven images, or you know, Jameson would talk about like thinking the rupture, but not what comes after, or whatever. I think that's right in some like a practical sense. Like if I had a clear vision of what emancipation looked like and how we could get there and how it could work, dude, we would not be in this room right now. Like we'd be doing that. Um, so I mean, I have to admit that I don't have it. I have to admit that um, I'm reticent about people who say they do have it. I have to admit in my faith in the big no that opens up the space for what might be un unexpected. That said, I think you're right about a series of things. It won't look like natives kicking out settlers, although I certainly would hope that Fanon's vision of what revolution looked like would not be reduced to that phrase, since I, don't, I, I think he argues fairly clearly that that's not an adequate formulation. Um, I continue to use the language of class in Maine, because I want to have a debate with people who continue with a very restricted sense of class, right, with the sociological image of a working class invented by factory inspectors in the 19th century, um, and insist that that's what the working class is, as opposed to a, um, a more capacious account of the proletariat, which I'm, as, as, I think, as I know you know, and various other people write that word originally, its etymological source is those without reserves. It doesn't mean people who work. It doesn't mean people who work in a factory. It means people who wake up in the morning and have a problem. Um, and I'm really interested in preserving that breadth as a way to think about possible recompositions uh, within the great sort of restructuring of, of global relations that doesn't have to be a recomposition around a specific labor practice or a specific work site uh, or so on. Uh, for me, class does a lot more work than just be like, look, factory workers increasingly cooperativized and gather together and they're going to have a union and like that's dead, right? That's dead. Uh, but I don't think that obviates the language of the proletariat as a framework for thinking about new kinds of composition. As for abolishing the economy, I don't know, what does that mean? I guess the thing I think, like, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also, I mean, actually I'm not joking, like abolition is for me a crucial term. Like I absolutely think that gender should be abolished, right? Like my, my model of gender struggles is all about gender abolition. My model of prison struggles is all about prison abolition and so on. It's, an, it's not an act of will, it's not an act of mind, and moreover, it's not an act of withdrawal. And this is the risk, right? There's a certain risk. I think it's a risk that belongs to certain segments of the population more than others that allows for a fantasy of withdrawal. Like, well, a commune in the small sense, right? Like 12 of us will move upstate um, and we'll start doing our own reproductive, like our own reproductive label, we'll reproduce ourselves outside of capital, we'll grow our own kale. <laughs> no, it used to be like the argument against communism was who will do the bath, who will clean the bathrooms, and now it's like we're all gonna have to eat kale. Um, uh, like the thing is, like if and, and this is like a micro model of this sort of idea of like oh abolition as as this activity that doesn't involve direct antagonism and confrontation, right? Twelve people do that, it's fine. Everyone's psyched. A hundred people do that. If a, large pe if a large percentage of people starts trying to remove themselves from the economy, 
that's simply not going to be allowed to happen by the state capital formation. Like, the state capital formation requires a certain amount of participation to generate itself and to regenerate itself, and it will, it will invite a war. The war will first appear as special taxation on lands that make it very expensive for people to withdraw to these lands, and if people don't want to do that, it's going to be a fight either way. This is what I always want to say. If you want to abolish the economy, it's going to involve a fucking war with capitalism. And I hope we can be can live with that. We won't all live. Uh, and, and so that to me is an important framework. So abolish the economy, I think, risk. It's like, well, we'll just abolish it. I'll give you stuff. <laughs> You'll give me stuff. Free giving. And I, I think that um, the compulsory participation of some and the compulsory exclusion of others comes to a head, not, not with a sort of decay into some different form, but with open antagonism. There's another hand somewhere, I thought. Yes, hi. Hi, and, and this isn't very well articulated, it may just be a comment. And the short version of the question really was, if you had any thoughts about the chapter in Fanon, this is the voice of Algeria. Um, what I liked so much about my strike riot was your reading of the highway and the blockage to currency and circulation. Um, and I'm very attentive in the voice of Algeria to the geography that Fanon writes about when he's trying to theorize the voice and the essence of the voice, whether a voice is the essence, whether we can understand the voice, and whether a voice is coherent. And uh, what strikes me in his reading of post-colonial radical radio in that chapter is that it's a very discontinuous voice. You know, one can't hear it, but it comes in for a few minutes, it breaks away, one doesn't know the, the, you know, the wavelength, and the wavelength keeps changing, keeps getting hacked by the French. Uh, there's no broadcast times for it, uh, there's no program, people crouch around it in different ways, and it becomes what he calls that Arab telephone, people pass on one voice to another. Um, so it's kind of, uh, I'm kind of wondering if you would accept maybe the premise that, you know, Phnom no in that chapter is his refusal to read the voice of Algeria, for him to say in some ways that there is no voice of Algeria. It's impossible to read because it's so discontinuous and it's so fragmented. You might be right, that might be more of a comment. Um, uh, I mean, but I, I, I mean, so I'll offer a, a, a thought that's parallel to that, maybe, and not, not in direct response, but I think that's, a, that's, that's well put and, and, and thoughtful. I'm really interested in this question of voice, of articulation, of discourse around this mode of struggle. And the, for me, the particular phrase that I often find myself working with and responding to, not from Fanon, but from Martin Luther King, in his defense of the riots, that's, that's the only the only p positive claim about riots that liberals will ever produce for you, which is King's quote, "The riot is the language of the unheard." And this is, in some sense, a magic phrase. It allows liberals who find riots to be terrifying and counterproductive and and apolitical and so on. It gives them some way to think about that in a way they can feel sympathetic to or open to often in ways that are perhaps a bit paternalistic. I also think it risks a terrible mistake, right? It's a mistake in that it's so appealing to us in this room, on a university campus, a bunch of people who are trained, trained to read everything as discourse, to read everything as a communication, to hear everything as a voice. We're so good at that. And I worry that that has a narcissistic limit that makes it hard to think about the practicalities of political struggle. When I think about a riot, which again, for me a riot is a fundamental political act, it's a form of class struggle, it's not different from a rebellion, I have no stake in that, it's just I'm trying to rescue the word riot instead of having it stand outside politics and understand that all those riots are, insur are insurgencies in the making. And they're interested in really practical activity, right? They want to destroy the power of the police. They want to make neighborhoods uninhabitable for people who they don't wish to inhabit them. They want to seize goods, and so on. And those practicalities, um, and their necessity, and their um, beloved illegitimacy, are fundamental. And I worry we lose them as soon as we reduce the riot to a communication of pain. Although, for sure, it is that. 
And I think Fanon is trying to puzzle in different ways through a similar dialectical pairing between communication, shared knowledge, the importance of those, but also the practicalities of the work of decolonial revolution, which won't necessarily involve uh, voice as what drives them. Uh, and uh, so that's just what I'd offer in response to that. We have time for maybe one more, if there's one more. Or we have time for coffee. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Rather than